वैष्णव जन तो Indeed, what His Holiness the Dalai Lama says is correct. The world is in need of the Mahatma's teachings, and that is why we organize this virtual global conference to reassert our faith and belief in the teachings of non-violence and peace. We now turn to our first keynote speaker for this evening. We have with us Honorable Frank Islam Sir, joining us live from the United States of America. I would request my technical team to please take Honorable Frank Islam Sir on the screen. An entrepreneur, philanthropist, civic leader, a thought leader, special commitment to civic, education, and artistic causes. In all his endeavors, he strives to create opportunities that are sustainable and uplifting for humanity, guided by virtues of hard work, focus, quality. innovation and kindness mr islam serves on several boards and councils advisory bodies including john f kennedy center board of trustees us institute of peace woodrow wilson center and likes he also serves as an esteemed member of board councils of renowned universities like the john hopkins american university george mason university Mr Islam is also involved in several charitable setups. He has several awards to his credit. He has been awarded the Martin Luther King Jr Legacy Award from the inter for international service in the year 2015. We are extremely fortunate sir to have you here with us today. I invite you to give your speech on this August occasion of the World Virtual Global Conference 2020 coming together for peace harmony good morning good morning can you hear me hello uh good morning sir we can hear you okay good uh good morning good afternoon and good evening depending where you are distinguished guests friends ladies and gentlemen A sense of humility brings us together as a fellow Indian, linked by common goals, common cause, common commitment, and bonded by shared history, shared heritage, and shared background. The lot that unite us, the little that divide us. Our bonds are stronger than the differences that too often drive us apart. Thank you, with Karsha, for that kind introduction. You did a fabulous job. I must have you everywhere for my introduction. I'm deeply grateful to all of you for your warm welcome. I want to thank the Jain People's Movement, especially Dr. Sudhir Tambi and Ashok Kermar, for inviting me to address this virtual global audience today, which happens to be the 151st birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Thank you, Dr. Tambi, for your leadership and all you're doing to make a profound difference in people's lives. A number of illustrious political and civil society leaders, humanitarian and Gandhians, are addressing this conference over the next several days, including my dear friend Sam Petroda. I am privileged and honored to be among this great lineup of speakers. I applaud the work that Jay Hind is doing, especially in Maharashtra, and your mission, which is creating a responsible, learned, and committed citizen, is indeed a noble mission. The building block of a great nation and society is a well-informed citizenry. Informed citizens keep leaders accountable. Citizenry is meaning and responsibility that comes with it has been one of the areas that I have been engaged in for close to a decade and a half through my writings and a, and a foundation that my wife Debbie and I launched to address an increasing civic engagement deficit around the world. including the united states and india as someone who believes that it is imperative imperative to prepare the citizenry for the challenges and opportunities of our time your work is extraordinarily important 
I cannot thank you enough for hosting this conference, which is taking place in the backdrop of two grave crises that we are facing. The first one is a health crisis. I'm confident that our scientists will be able to tackle COVID-19 sooner rather than later by developing a vaccine or multiple vaccine. The second crisis we are facing today is the protocol in nature. It is an increasing deficit in democracy and liberal values, right wing of, of demagogue and suppression of human rights and religious freedom in many important parts of the world. The antidote, the vaccine, for that is the teaching of leaders like Mahatma Gandhi and the work that civil society organization like yours is doing. My, my remarks today will focus on that aspect within the context of the topic of this session, which is Mahatma Gandhi, peace, harmony, and progress. I will share my thoughts with you, not an expert in any of these topics, not as an academic, not as a researcher, but as a civically engaged Indian American business person whose motherland is India, whose homeland is the United States of America. I deeply love both countries and recognize that they are by far the two largest democracies in the world and the feature of these democracies is central to the future democracies and democratic values worldwide and the vision of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. With that preamble, let me start by focusing on the state of democracy in the world today. Sadly, I must report that the state is not good. In fact, it could be called awful. Two years ago, Freedom House, a Washington-based organization that conducts research and advocacy on democracy, political freedom, and human rights, declared in its report, Freedom in the World 2018, that democracy was in crisis. For the 12th consecutive year, political rights and civil liberties declined, and the 70 countries suffered net declines and only 35 registered gains. Things have not gotten any better in the past year. Freedom House report Freedom in the World 2019 declared that democracy was in retreat with 68 countries showing net declines. In this 21st century, democracy is descending and autocracy is ascending in countries around the world. In addition to the Freedom House finding numerous other studies are showing that trend. For example, a Pew Research Center survey last year in 38 countries found, I only quote, a shallow commitment to representative democracy and substantial percentages willing to consider non democratic options across all of those countries. That's a bit abstract and conceptual. Let me bring it up close and personal by focusing on two, two countries of my heritage America and India. The Pew study found that in the United States, 40% of the respondents were fully committed to representative democracy, 46% were less committed, and 7% preferred a non-democratic option. That is not very good, but it is exceptional compared to the findings for India. The Pew study disclosed that of all the countries support, all the countries survey support for a strong leader who's unchecked by the judiciary or parliament is the highest in India. Only 8% of Indian respondents were fully committed to representative democracy, 67% were less committed, and 9% preferred a non-democratic options. As you all know, the India and United States are the world's two last, largest democracies. Active and engaged citizenship is essential to keep those democracies vital and vibrant and exemplar for democracy worldwide and to fulfill the vision of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. I was awarded the Martin Luther King Award in the United States in 2015. I felt doubly blessed to be given that honor because of the indelible connection between Mahatma Gandhi and King. As Dr. King noted in a radio broadcast during a visit to India in 1959, and I quote, if this age is to survive, it must follow the way of love and nonviolence that Gandhi so nobly illustrated in his life. Dr. King and Gandhi have been beacons to me in my personal life 
and charitable and philanthropic involvement I have given to numerous causes to support humanitarian efforts to advance the interest of the underserved in the world. Mahatma Gandhi told us that you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Dr. King advised us that every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. I have heard the words of Dr. King and Mr. Gandhi, I'm trying my best to walk in the light and to be the change. I know that is true for all of you in this audience here this morning as well. And I am proud to be partnered with all of you on this sacred mission. It is critically important one because as the novelist and civil rights activist Marianne Wright Edelman observed, a lot of people are waiting for Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi to come back, but they're gone. We are it, it's up to us, it's up to you. I agree wholeheartedly with Ms. Rice of responsibility to carry forward the good work of King and Gandhi. It's up to us, it's up to you, and it's up to me. But I do not agree that these two great men are gone. They live on each, they live on through each and every one of us who are willing to pick up the baton of nonviolence and use it as an instrument for peace and making the world a healthier and better place for all. Now let me share some thoughts on what we can do to working together to build communal peace and harmony. Consider the teaching of Pandit Malavia, the founder of Banaras in the University. He was a visionary who saw the world not through religious blinder, but through an expansive view of what is strong and inclusive faith can do to unite rather than divide us. Pandit Malavia instructed, India is not a country of Hindus only, it is a country of the Muslims, the Christians and Parsis, and the countries can gain strength and develop itself only when the people of India live in mutual goodwill and harmony. Taking a lesson from him in order to create an atmosphere of communal peace and harmony, we need to discover our spiritual common ground. That is because his spirituality transcends religious, racial, and regional boundaries. The spirit is the invisible force that brings us together, regardless of our particular predisposition. It allows us to look to the heaven and to the God whom we worship, but to look at the earth and the people and the family that we are. There are many actions the members of that family can take to move towards communal peace and harmony. In my opinion, the key actions and actors include religious leader promoting interfaith dialogue, political leaders promoting a framework for unity, citizen leader promoting communications and collaborations. The religious leaders are in a unique position to build bridges, to break down the barriers, to promote dialogue of understanding, to forge strong bonds among different faiths. They can be accomplished by reinforcing a point the attack on one religion is attack on all religion. When we, when we attack each other based on people's faith, we are tearing apart the harmonious, harmonious fabric of India. We need to figure out how to live together, how to work together, how to heal together, and how to redeem the promise of India. The political leaders have the responsibility to ensure that all laws are fair and enforced uniformly. They can take affirmative action to promote an atmosphere of peace, of peace and harmony. They need to develop a plan of what can be done to strengthen those bonds that binds all Indians as one family. They need to promote voice for understanding, cooperation and civility among faith. Citizen leader can lead by example by sponsoring events, investing plans and programs that cut across and eliminate racial, religious, and socioeconomic divides. They can play a vital role in diffusing tensions 
and helping our youth understand the need for collaborations and communication. They can play a pivotal role by promoting the unique benefits of message of unity by articulating we are stronger together. When we are stronger, when we are together, we can help shape a better future for India. There's a much work to do. The work must begin, however, by imagining an atmosphere of communal peace and harmony. Imagining would not make it so, but not imagining will make it impossible. The key to progress is civic engagement. Sometimes when I say civic engagement, people mistakenly think I mean political engagement. I do not. Political engagement is a form of civic engagement, but just one form. Civic engagement, as I view, takes five primary forms. Civic individual engagement being the best one can be and personal response to one's actions. Organization engagement contributing to the success of the group, for example, business, religion, associations to which one belongs. Political engagement, participating in those processes to shape the structure and the nature of government. Community engagement, collaborating to make the locale and the world in which we live a better place. Social engagement, advocating for justice and equality of treatment and opportunity and inclusive ec economic mobility for all, regardless of caste, creed, religion, race, background, and belief. Let me bring this back to Mahatma Gandhi now in retrospect, as, as I look back on my own personal life, on my own civic engagement, I recognize the gift of being from and in India and the struggles they were endured to make this great country a democratic republic. As you all know, Mahatma Gandhi made our citizenship possible. I do not know if Mahatma Gandhi ever used the term civic engagement I do know that without him, there would be no Republic Day for India. And without his influence and impact on others, the United States and the world would be a far different place. As you know, Mahatma Gandhi's teaching and his approach to civic engagement are centered around peace, love, and nonviolence. In the past few years, radical extremists have countered Mahatma Gandhi and his teaching and his preaching with acts of war, hate, and violence. If they are successful Republic Day in India, in the places around the world that celebrate democracy and diversity will become a distant memory. In traditions of Mahatma Gandhi and his followers who came before us, I firmly believe that you and I, along with others who understand the values of free society, can prevent that apocalyptic vision. This is our responsibility, it's my responsibility, and it is your responsibility. In making your choice of how to fulfill the responsibility, the one piece of advice that I'll give you is to not to be timid in making your choices for civic engagement and have the courage to be a difference maker. In closing, let me leave you with two thoughts, one from Robert F. Kennedy, the president of John F. Kennedy's younger brother and the other from me. Robert F. Kennedy said, and I quote, some men see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask, why not? Frank Islam says, set no limits. If you can conceive it, you can believe it, you can achieve it. In this 21st century, when democracies around the world are being so tempest-torn, there's a critical need for constructive citizen engagement that changes the current trajectory. I believe those of who you are as a part of Jai Hind People's Movement, regardless of education, discipline, or profession, that you have the technical expertise and the moral fortitude 
to be the leaders in changing that trajectory. Therefore, I call upon you to be difference makers for democracy. As I close this speech, this remark, thank you for listening to and, and sharing this time with me. May God bless you and all you do to build communal peace and harmony in your home nations and around this troubled world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your extremely profound and valuable views you shared with us today. I would request the technical team to please go ahead and play the video you have shared with us. The receiving ceremony and remarks of Islam, sir, on the receiving of Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Award. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the stage our honoree for the Civic Engagement Award, Mr. Frank F. Islam. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mayor Lawson, for your leadership. Uh, Congressman just left. Uh, he has to pick up a plane to go to Michigan. Thank you, Congressman, for your leadership, and thank you very for your introduction. It is a privilege to receive this award with such other distinguished honorees. I'm most pleased to accept it on the day before Martin Luther King's birthday, the day on which we acknowledge and celebrate not only the birth of Dr. King, but also the birth that he gave to the civil and human rights movement here in the United States and around the world. I feel doubly blessed to be given this honor because of the indelible connection between Dr. King and other famous civil and human rights leader from my homeland where I was born, India, Mahatma Gandhi. As Dr. King noted in a radio broadcast when he visited to India in 1959, if this age is to survive, it must follow the way of love and nonviolence that Gandhi so nobly illustrated in his life. Dr. King and Gandhi have been beacons to me in my personal life and charitable and philanthropic involvement. I have given to numerous causes to support humanitarian efforts and to advance the interest of the underserved in the world. I'm on the advisory board and a major contributor to the US Institute of Peace, an organization devoted to the nonviolent prevention and mitigation of deadly conflict around the globe. I also serve on the cabinet of the Woodrow Wilson Center Board, which is dedicated to being the nation's leading institution for in-depth research and dialogue for actionable ideas on global issues. The majority of those ideas are directed at nonviolent solutions to increase human and civil rights. Mahatma Gandhi told us that you must be the change you wish to see in the world. On the other hand, Dr. King advises us that every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. I have heard the words of Dr. King and Mr. Gandhi, and I'm trying my best to walk in the light and to be the change. I know that all of you in this audience here this morning as well, and I'm proud to be partner with you on this sacred mission. It is a critically important one because as a novelist <clears throat> and civil rights activist, Marion Wright Edelman observed, a lot of people are waiting for Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi to come back, but they are gone. We are it. It's up to us. It's up to you. I agree wholeheartedly with Ms. Wright's statement of responsibility to carry forward the good work are Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi. So it's up to us, it's up to you, it's up to me to carry his legacy and to carry his ideals. But I do not agree that those great men are gone. They live and through each and every one of us, 
who are willing to pick up the baton of nonviolence and a peace and use it as an instrument for peace and making the world a healthier and better place for all. I'm merely one of the many who have made this commitment, most of whom will never receive public recognition for having done so. Therefore, with all due humility, I'm honored to accept the Martin Luther King Award for International Service for myself and on their behalf. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you so much, Islam, sir. We really appreciate you coming together for us on this conference and giving us your thoughts on the entire conference idea. We look forward to your support and your guidance in the future for Jai Hind People's Movement. Thank you so much, sir, for joining with us. We move on to our next speaker. We move on to our next speaker, Sam Petroda.